Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on the OSTP public access guidance. Uh, one year later, uh, what have we learned, and where do we go next? I am Tom Chavarella. I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a fantastic panel that's ready to share their insights with us, and uh, we have a lot of information to cover in only 40 minutes, and we definitely want to leave time for your questions as well. So I'm going to make some very brief introductions of myself and the panel, I'm going to share a couple of slides about the Nelson Memo and the OSTP guidance itself, just so we can all level set, and then we'll get into uh, the panel discussion and then uh, the Q&A. So it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome our panel. We have Michelle Avasar Whiting, who is the program officer of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We have Torsten Reimer, the dean of uh, the University Library at the University of Chicago, and Daniel Sepulveda, senior vice president at Platinum Advisors and also a former US ambassador on information technology. Um, also, before we go on, just a little bit of disclosure. Uh, when I am not being a moderator for panels, I am the head of public affairs and advocacy for Frontiers, which is a gold open access publisher. Of course, gold open access publishers have a very distinct view of where we think the STM world should go, but that's not what this panel is for. It is for all of those views to be discussed, so please ask away. Uh, as I noted, I wanted to give a little bit of information about where we stand in terms of the Nelson Memo and the OSTP guidance. Uh, this slide comes directly from the OSTP from one of their calls a few months ago. Uh, we are moving from a world where we're moving away from what was called the Holdren Memo in 2013, which laid out uh, the 12-month embargo and other stipulations, and moving toward the new guidance from August of 2022 that will get rid of that embargo, make all of the underlying data open as well, and add a few other stipulations on top of that. Uh, on this slide, uh, we are right in the middle Section three, agency policies. That is where we exist right now in terms of the OSTP guidance. Everything is supposed to go into effect by the end of 2025. A number of agencies have put out draft plans or requests for information on the guidance. Meanwhile, uh, in Congress, uh, there have been some moves to try to limit what the Nelson memo can do for various and assorted reasons, which we will get into. Uh, because this is a library conference, I would like to start first with Torsten, given his background, um, not only in the US, but also in the UK, and also as a part of the Ivy Plus coalition of libraries. Um, he is like having three panelists in one. So <laughs> he has an excellent start for the day. Torsten, would you mind sharing a little bit on um, the Nelson Memo itself and how those different worlds that you've interacted in have responded to it over the past year. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to do this, and I'm, I'm waving to you in the front corner who maybe can't see me throughout all of this. Um, <clears throat> it's great to be here. I, uh, I've been told I have to give three statements in one. Um, one from the perspective of the Ivy Plus uh, libraries, um, where I'm the current chair of the group. Then also the University of Chicago Library is unique in that it's both part of the Ivy Plus uh, libraries Confederation, but also of the Big Ten Academic Alliance Libraries Initiative. And then, obviously, I also have a perspective as the university librarian at the University of Chicago. And I might even have a personal perspective uh, that I can maybe briefly touch upon. From the perspective of the Ivy Plus libraries, I think we are committed to supporting our faculty and students to have the broadest possible impact with their research. And we think making that available openly is the best way of supporting it. That's, I think, something that um, the group's very clear and clearly united on. And we have, uh, and this is, I guess, part of why I'm here today, a few months ago released an open statement where we effectively said two things, and I'm maybe somewhat oversimplifying this. We're strongly in favor of open access, and we support the memo and want to work with funders to get it implemented well. And secondly, we are concerned that um, there could be an expectation or perhaps even a policy that the only valid way to compliance is to pay for open access, as in an article processing charge. And we felt however these should be implemented, this should not be the only way. And in fact, we feel uh, a way that we prefer, having invested no insignificant amount of resources in repository infrastructures, is that the green way of being compliant should be 
um, a perfectly acceptable, well-supported and well-communicated way of, uh, of compliance. So that's what we said. We are watching the environment with great interest, and um, we've just noticed, I guess like some others, that there is uh, a society publisher who uh, has been floating the idea of an article development charge, which would effectively be charging authors for being allowed to put an article into a repository to be compliant with this policy, which is a development that exactly, I think, goes against uh, what we outlined we would like to see in the original uh, statement. So we're currently thinking if maybe there should be a second statement where we um, are clear on the kind of change that we'd like to see and where we are also going to think more what we are going to do as a confederation of libraries that I guess historically has mostly been known on putting a lot of effort into making interlibrary loan between our 13 campuses more efficient. And we are now preparing to put some serious resource and effort and coordinated work of the 13 of us behind working on a global scale to help advance something along the lines of the memo that we are closely aligned with. The Big Ten Academic Alliance, I think, has a similar view, though not currently being the chair and us not having released a statement, I'll just say in general, that the BTAA libraries are also very strongly aligned and supportive of open access. And <clears throat> what we are currently looking at in particular is uh, the challenge that this is not just an open access challenge, even though that's what is most talked about. In terms of scale, the much bigger challenge is research data, um, because you could say, well, making everything open access on the date of publication, in principle, we know how to do it. We can argue about the best way, but it seems feasible. Making all the data that's cited in those publications and that supports them uh, available, and at least currently, the memo does not stipulate an end date, that's a major undertaking. So what we are currently gearing up to do in the BTAA is to use the opportunity that it's not just the libraries, but also the provost, the CIOs, and others, to have a, a consultation about how we can all work together about building um, a university run and maintained, stable long-term infrastructure that's suitable for publishing both open access scholarly outputs in the traditional article, book chapter, and, and book way, um, but also the wide and wonderful world of research data and all sort of other types of not standard type publications. So that's, I think, the second uh, big challenge. Mm -hmm. And at the University of Chicago Library, we're looking at all three of those, although we are sort of in the position that when I joined last uh, spring, we had a university repository, but no repository manager. We had a center for digital scholarship, but no staff in there. And so we've since been busy uh, hiring. We now have sort of the core of the team that will look at those. We are, as it happens, currently recruiting for head of research data services. If you know anyone who wants to work with us, uh, please send them my way. But we are approaching this, and I was very deliberate on this, not in the view that this would be library infrastructure, but that what we're trying to build at the University of Chicago is university infrastructure. So we've set up a university-wide working group that will look at research data management and sharing, which I chair, but where the aim is, again, not to build a library service, but to build a university-wide service where we can work together and support this. And the University of Chicago itself has no direct position uh, on the memo, but it has a few core values, freedom of expression and freedom of inquiry. So the idea that everyone should be enabled to research whatever they want to research and should be able to talk about it and share it. And if that doesn't very clearly speak to uh, open access and immediate open access, then I don't know what else our values would speak to. So these are, I think, sort of three perspectives on, on challenges that we're currently working on. But I want to wrap up my introductory statement. Um, I'm a historian by training. You, you, you can't have me on a microphone without giving a, at least a brief historical uh, well, anecdote of sorts. Um, about 10 years ago, the UK was in a very similar position to the US now, that funders had made it clear what their expectations are for open access. And they also made it clear what their expectations are for research data. And I was at Imperial College in London at the time, where my brief from the provost was, fix this, I mean, slightly longer. Um, and universities across the UK have built uh, infrastructures for supporting data and open access. And one fairly clear consensus that emerged at the time was um, that in the way it's currently set up, and I think that's broadly still true today, we didn't find gold open access to be sustainable. In fact, the money that the government had made available in the UK 
paid only for a fraction of this. Even the whole acquisitions budget at Imperial College at the time wouldn't have covered like 40% of the APC cost that would have been required to publish all the outputs from the university. And the core thing that we found that worked really well in achieving very, very high open access rates in the UK was very clear messaging from the universities and from the funders, which is deposit your manuscript at the time of acceptance in an institutional repository and your library will do everything else that's needed to make sure that you are compliant. And that has seen a massive transformation with the workflows that we set up at Imperial College. In three years, we increased open access output in the repository by a factor of 35 and we only had to increase the number of staff in the area by a factor of three. So that gives my personal view on what an efficient workflow would look like and in some ways what I'm trying to replicate now. Thank you very much, Torsten. And that's actually a very nice bridge to Michelle because you are going to give the funder perspective, mostly HHMI. We're not going to ask you to speak for all of the funders all over the world. Uh, but um, it's nice to have you here especially because funders aren't generally a large presence at this meeting, when we're talking about finances at this meeting, it's usually from, from the library side as opposed to the start of the manuscript process. So I would love to hear your thoughts on how HHA Mine has responded to the Nelson memo. And just when you speak with other funders, what's the general consensus of how to move forward? Are there any other funders here in this room? OK, I might act, we might actually be the only <laughs> ones. Um, I was curious. Um, yeah, so I'm not a historian, but I, I'll still give a little bit of history because I think it will help foreground um, what I say about our uh, reaction at HHMI to the release of the, the Nelson Memo guidance. Um, so HHMI has a storied history of supporting open access initiatives. Um, the 2003 Bethesda you know, meeting was convened by HHMI, uh, you know, near Chevy Chase office in uh, Bethesda and led to the Bethesda Statement on Open Access, which is one of the three big B city statements. Um, and then in 2007, I believe, is when we uh, started our own public access, public access uh, policy, kind of the uh, Holdren memo equivalent um, that we had before our current uh, open access policy, which was just launched in 2022, January 1st, 2022. And I was brought on not long after that, um, primarily to help steward this new uh, open access policy and really help support our researchers in um, being compliant with it, understanding it, and, and making sure that they were compliant with it and helping them to get there. Um, so that gives you a little bit of background um, on, you know, how HHMI probably feels toward uh, open access and how much of an important part of our mission and our vision that has uh, played. Uh, so I, when I started, it was August of 2022, and it was literally the week that the Nelson memo dropped. So I totally took responsibility for that. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, I willed it to happen. Um, and it was pretty cool because I was actually there, you know, for the first time at the, the headquarters of HHMI, and I had people dropping by my brand new office that I was seated in to say, can you believe it? Um, and I, I wasn't really sure what they were talking about because this is all kind of new to me. Um, but it, it quickly became apparent that this was a really big deal um, to everybody who had been there working on these types of initiatives in, on the sort of institutional level for a long time. Um, and, you know, kind of feel the ripple effects of it, uh, obviously through Coalition S, which we are a member, um, and out to, you know, uh, yeah, uh, funders within the, you know, other private funders in the U.S. and beyond. Um, so I guess I can give a little bit of the, the Coalition S perspective mm -hmm. um, as well, because we are, you know, we're uh, a, a member of that coalition. Um, our response and Coalition S response, of course, was very uh, welcoming of this mm -hmm. guidance. I mean, it was a, finally, that this is happening. Um, it felt long overdue, but now it was here, and it meant um, for us and for many of those funders that um, we would have more alignment 
um, for authors. So you, we know that collaboration is uh, everywhere and their author lists are very heterogeneous and you have a lot of diversity right now in what is expected of different authors on a given manuscript. And this would level set. Um, certainly for our investigators, many of them have NIH funding, NSF funding, and um, they have to navigate that. So like they their requirement from, from HHMI is much more stringent than what the NIH has been expecting of them. And now that will be a lot more consistent. Although with the notable exception, and this is where I just want to flag this because it was what struck me when I first, and, and many others, I'm not claiming credit for noticing this, uh, when I first read the guidance was regarding the, it's not an open access uh, memo, right? It's a, it's a public access one. And the big distinction here is the requirement for a CC BY license mm -hmm. or an open license at all. There is no commentary on mm -hmm. licenses. Um, and this to, to us felt like a miss. And I think, you know, because this is one of the principles of Coalition S is um, Plan S, um, also a miss from a lot of their perspectives. Uh, with the caveat or the, the acknowledgement that OSTP's remit is really big and includes humanities and other fields where I'm not going to claim to understand why open licensing may not necessarily be appropriate for all of the, for all of the agencies, uh, the more I learn about open licensing, the more I understand how critical it is. Uh, for all the problems that we want to solve around reproducibility, um, having uh, unrestricted reuse of, of science is a pivotal part of HHMI's policy, uh, and I think it will be a major miss if the agencies don't uh, adopt this as well. Uh, so that's one thing that I that I think has been uh, a major focus, and hopefully it's that heterogeneity that stopped them from making this a, a blanket uh, requirement, and that the individual agencies will consider this on a case-by-case -case basis for the, uh, the group, the, the communities that they serve. Um, what else do I want to say about, what else did you ask me to say? <laughs> You covered it mostly. You especially wanted to speak about the licenses, and that was that was a big part. Yep, that's the it. big thing. And yeah. I'm sure I'll think of other things as we as we go through the discussion. But I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a really good segue into one of what I wanted to ask Daniel about, which was um, you know, this, as, as you said, Michelle, this is public access, not open access. There's nothing in the Nelson memo that tries to mandate the way a publisher operates, yet that hasn't stopped certain parties from trying to interpret it that way, which has led to um, a wealth of jockeying over the past year. And Daniel, if you could speak to a little bit about how the interested parties in this have reacted in the past year. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, so the principal interested party here that I'm concerned about is Congress uh, as it relates to the OSTP. So Congress has oversight jurisdiction over the executive branch of government. We obviously we have an authorizing committee that has authorizing oversight over the agencies and the OSCP. And then we have appropriations committees that fund the authorized executable activities. Right now, when, we, when I was here last year, I said that the things to look out for were one, potential hearings or public dialogue or discourse, potential legislation that would be introduced relative to the OSCP. Un interestingly, none of that happened. No one has introduced legislation to codify the OSCP guidance. No one has introduced legislation to, den to deny the, cod the codification of the OSTP language or to put the previous language into law as opposed to in guidance. Neither of those things happened, and there haven't been hearings. Neither the authorizing, the, the authorizing committees haven't had hearings on the subject. So, the, but the other thing that I did say to look out for was appropriations language. And so what happens in an appropriations bill from time to time is if an authorizing committee or the Congress doesn't write law, you put what's called a policy rider on an appropriations bill. You make policy through the funding process. So in this case, the House Energy, Commerce, and Justice subcommittee deny is, is, has presented the legislation to deny the OSTP the authority to execute its memo. Okay? There has been some discussion about what that means. What that means is that one subcommittee of one committee of one body of Congress doesn't want the OSCP to execute its memo. That's all that means. The Senate has moved to Commerce, Justice, and Science 
appropriations bill on a bipartisan basis without that language. In the House, Congresswoman Eshoo, who is the lead on the authorizing committee on this issue, has offered an amendment to the CGIS subcommittee appropriations bill to strike that language. I know this all sounds like a ton of inside baseball, and I'm happy to, to walk through it a little bit more, but the long and short of it is, is that the chances of that language becoming law are very, very slim. Does that mean the language doesn't matter? No, because somehow someone advocated for that language to be in that bill, and the majority of the majority side of that subcommittee agrees. And they laid out in their language, not in the bill language, but in the report language, what exactly their concerns are. I'm not going to read those to you, but it's worth looking at. And there should be a discussion about what those concerns are, because they are worth having a conversation about. Um, so we'll see how, how that moves forward. And it also tells you a little bit about what might happen in a future Congress um, and the fact that the committee is maintaining a continuous uh, eye on this subject. As to two of the specific issues that were raised by my colleagues here, one on the business model, uh, I believe in the Nelson memo, and I know in the economic landscape of the federal public access policy report that they wrote, they were explicitly agnostic on diamond, gold, or green. So all are equally or co-equally compliant in the eyes of the OSTP. Um, and then on licensing, they, they don't state to be agnostic, but the lack of language uh, in either the memo or in the report indicates to me that, that they are intend to be neutral, if not agnostic, on that subject. And you can see that that, that would change over time. A future OSTP may choose to look at uh, the licensing requirements or intellectual property associated issues and come to different conclusions or, 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 or whatever. And again, Congress still has and always will have the authority to write law to direct the executive to execute publicly financed research and its distribution, however Congress wishes to see it done. But that has to go through a hearing process, a markup process, a deliberative process until you get to legislation. Uh, and we're just not, we're nowhere near that because we haven't had any of that um, to date. So in, in short, I think that there is more support than lack of it for what the OSCP is doing in Congress, or maybe better put, there's more lack of opposition than there is opposition to what the OSCP do, is doing in Congress. Uh, otherwise, you would see it in the Senate bill. Otherwise, you wouldn't have um, the Democrats offering an amendment to strike. And then, because this is guidance and not law, uh, it's still open to modification and interpretation at the specific agency level, and then obviously at the OSTP level, whenever and however they wish going forward. Thank you very much, Daniel. And something has come up, and um, I'm going to turn it over to questions uh, next because we're about 15 minutes left, and I know there's a lot of questions out there. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, something that's come up in all of your worlds separately because you don't always speak with each other, but there's been a lot of talk about what is considered reasonable in terms of costs, in terms of process, and so I just want to put that out there. Perhaps I can start with you, Michelle, because we, you, you and I talked a little bit about this. You know, you, you said you know, H, HHMI definitely believes that certain things are reasonable. You have a funder view of it. But uh, is that something that you want to give a little voice to? Um, I, I think what I said was we, we say we use the word reasonable mm -hmm. and we haven't defined it. Right. And I think that we see that a lot. People say reasonable costs. Um, the fact that we, we do still see invoices that are uh, higher than 10K for a publication um, and pay them means that that doesn't have any meaning right now. Um, and I think, uh, as I've, I've spoken to a few publishers here today, uh, today and yesterday, um, you know, we are, we are gradually closing the circle on what we are going to be happy to pay for. Uh, even with the budgets that HHMI has, which I think everybody knows are exceptionally large, this is a strain. Uh, and, it's, and because our authors, our scientists, see those numbers, and yes, that is by design, um, they can do the math themselves on you know, uh, 
how this is a zero sum game and the money that they're not that they're spending on five publications here they're not spending on a postdoc um, that year so this is a this is a problem if this is a problem even for such well-funded researchers then you can only imagine uh, what it's going to what kind of problem it's going to present for for everyone else mm -hmm. Um, so I think my, my gripe is that we haven't defined reasonable and we, we need to um, soon, especially with this guidance coming down the pipe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I might ask some of you to... Yes, of course. So um, the OSCP isn't a regulatory body. They're not regulatory, regulating the publishing industry. They're not regulating pricing in the publishing industry. To the degree that you are going to get into a discussion about the regulation of reasonable prices, we do this in other areas in telecom and in network regulation. Sometimes you regulate for at-cost services, or sometimes you regulate at-cost plus a reasonable profit. All of these things are really hard to do, and they involve more lawyers than you want involved in any situation. <laughs> to some degree, reasonable is a conversation. Um, I can tell you there are many, many private sector services that a researcher will use or any public grant recipient will use to the degree that you're using them in a careless way will be obvious. So if you're taking first class flights to conferences every time, it's probably unreasonable, right? That doesn't mean that the price of that flight is unreasonable, it's probably worth that. You shouldn't be spending that to get to a conference. And so those are conversations that the funder, in this case the government of the United States, will have to have with researchers about how they spend their money on this particular private sector service. Uh, but I would be very, very hesitant to get to an idea where there's someone in some agency doing the math around what is reasonable or not. Thank you very much. And um, uh, just before you answer, if anybody does have something they would like to ask, if you would like to start to queue up uh, while Torsten is speaking so we can get to your questions. Thank you. So as the uh, librarian on the panel, I'm probably expected to say, yes, I have a view what a reasonable cost is and maybe put uh, something out for a low APC. And I mean, obviously, being responsible for the university's acquisitions budget, I, I prefer a price to be low. Um, but it's interesting in that we pay for a lot of things, and this seems to be one thing where we want some regulation on the price, and in many other cases we don't. And I think to me the more important question is as to why that is the case. Um, and the current economy that we live in is largely built around the idea that at least broadly speaking the market will define the price and that competition will drive the price down. So for me, actually, the more interesting question is, uh, is scholarly publishing in the way how it's set out so that there is a functioning market? And if there isn't a functioning market, uh, shouldn't we rather, instead of arguing what the APC is, argue about what we as consumers or what regulators should think about how we could move towards a functioning market? And then we wouldn't have to argue what the price is because the market would then determine that price. I mean, we could also think about a different way of coming to that, but at least in the current environment that we work in, thinking about a, a functioning market with competition that might drive prices down, that's the conversation I'd like to see. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Rachel Fleming. I'm from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, Torsten, especially you were uh, speaking about being able to staff up some of these areas of support, um, but most of us um, don't work at uh, IV Plus, Big Ten, or even ARL libraries. Most of the librarians and researchers are at regional comprehensives or smaller and aren't even staffed to be supporting what we're doing now. So um, could you um, speak to how we can advocate in the library and in our offices of researchers to get the staffing that we need and also to uh, what well-resourced institutions are doing to provide for the larger uh, academic infrastructure? I mean, this is a challenging one. And having recently visited some of my colleagues at the IVs, there are people working at Ivy libraries who feel they are resource constrained for what they need to do. In fact, when I was a student and I worked at Microsoft in Germany, some of my colleagues felt they were resource constrained. So that's probably in some ways a given, but I don't want to disagree with you because you are in a different situation than, um, say, we are in IPLC. I think ultimately it comes down to having some of the same discussions that I have, which is if I go to my provost and say the library needs more money, uh, I can sort of see how that discussion will go because there's a very long queue of people who will say that this or that union needs more money. The argument is rather the university is faced with this challenge 
And if we don't invest in a service at the university level, these will be the negative consequences. Um, perhaps being able to quantify some of them. When I was at Imperial College, one thing we did is we spent a bit of time understanding how much time does it take a, a researcher to directly put an article into a repository? How much time does it take a researcher to negotiate and set up the whole payment for an APC? And then we looked at what the trained librarian who does this every day does, and obviously the time difference is massive. And then you can say, um, do a ballpark calculation and say, if we leave the researchers to this by themselves, it will cost X. And if we hire two staff in the library at a tenth of the price, we can get all of this done. We get more goodwill and fewer uh, academics queuing at the office of the provost and complaining that they have all the admin work to do and rather say it's good that the library is doing this. This has worked well for me in the past, but ultimately it really comes down to not speak about the library, but speak about the library can help the university. And I think then there is a bit of a wider responsibility for those well-resourced organizations to invest in community infrastructures and for us to shift some of our acquisitions budget in supporting not-for-profits that work in that space, uh, community organizations and others that maybe can jointly provide some of the services that it might be harder for other institutions to do. And that's certainly something that we're now wanting to look at very actively in IPLC but that we're also talking about in the Big Ten. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Alexis Macklin, Carlo University. Thank you all for your presentation today. Daniel said something that got me thinking right after Michelle said something that got me thinking. And I'm coming at this from, I'm not currently a program officer, but I have been in the past. So I'm going to couch this. I hope I'm eloquent enough about it. But what I'm wondering is, when Daniel said, make policy through, and I think you said funding initiatives or funding strategies, which I think is critical because so many of our foundations are driving our policies, right? They're driving this. I'm worried right now because OSTP has created equity issues beyond what we could have possibly have imagined. And I'm wondering what the funders, what the foundations, what the federal governments, what the private foundations who are requiring these like gates, are doing to help us create a more sustainable, what obligation do they have to help us create a sustainable, more equitable approach to this? I'm curious a little bit what you mean by OSTP has left us with this equity issue. And I think what you mean is they kind of, they set the end goal and said, now you figure it out. Okay. Yeah. Um, and now I do think that all of us have a responsibility to figure out how, how to actually make this work. Because, of course, if all of the journals flip to open access, um, the numbers are just going to skyrocket. Um, so I, I appreciate that that's an issue. And this is where, this is where HHMI, um, one of my, my first job uh, when, I, when I started that week was to write a letter to uh, President Biden and Alondra Nelson to thank them for this. No pressure. Week one <laughs> there. Um, and also to, to say what we can say about what we can offer if they want to partner with us, just like we've partnered with Coalition S, um, to think about ways through this for the individual agencies. And from the HHMI perspective, um, it's going to be about thinking outside the box here. And I mean, there's been endless talk about this, so we could wax poetic about S2O and, and uh, other models. Um, for HHMI, it's really about uh, a preprint-based system that has open peer review, transparent peer review. This is what we're increasingly going to be happy to pay for, uh, services, not APCs. You know, you tell us what the service is. The output has to be there. There has to be evidence that peer review took place. Um, ideally, really, the, uh, uh, a rejection of this binary notion of accept, acceptance and rejection for each article. I know everyone is thinking I'm just talking about eLife now, but I'm not just talking about eLife. Um, there are many other ways to imagine a system like that, but it will, it will relieve a huge amount of pressure uh, and also waste. I mean, I could go on uh, about all the ways that this will make things better, this is the kind of thing that we want to pay for. And certainly, we want to pay for experiment experimentation in this area. 
Um, we want to see a lot of diversity of different approaches to this, and, and to us, this is going to be the equitable path. So this is a super interesting question for many, many reasons, um, but it, it, it gets to why I think that there really does need to be a more robust and public conversation about the issue, because the fact that you raised the question, that the OSCP issued this guidance on the basis of equity, on the basis that they were pursuing equity. So what you're raising a challenge of is it directly contradicts that purpose. We can, there are people having interesting conversations about that. I've heard both sides of the argument. They're both worth listening to. It hasn't been had in front of Congress. Um, and until it is, and until Congress decides one way or the other, or whatever comment they want to send to the OSTP, I think um, it's, it's ill-informed to deny the OSCP the money to execute the memo. Um, but that's just one man's opinion. But again, I do think that it's an incredibly important issue, and it get, really gets to the core of whether or not this is a policy that is in the public interest. Right now. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, Wayne Manis from Cold Spring Harbor. Um, great conversation. I wish we could go on for another hour. But um, very briefly, uh, this has been touched upon. From our perspective, we kind of see this as the next wave of the cereals crisis, where subscriptions were going wildly out of control for many, for prices. And um, APCs are nominally mentioned here and there. Um, and I wonder, could I suggest that there's a question about what the price is? You know, not every dollar is the same. We, we make a very small margin just to stay afloat, but every dollar we get goes to back to research. And, you know, the mission, we align with many other publishers like us, and I'm speaking for our field, not every, it's not appropriate for every field, but not every dollar is the same. You know, th there is a, a notion that there's transparency now about what happens behind the scenes with those APCs, and that's, that's good, but not every dollar goes to research. And I wonder if there's a sense of aligning missions around that, not to disadvantage um, publishers that have shareholders, but um, can anyone talk about that a little bit? Because it's been happening for a while, the discussion about prices, and we've got to get the price down, we got to, but not all prices are the same, even if the prices are identical, if you know what I mean. Anyone? So I think what you're saying is that not all material effects of spending are the same, regardless of the dollars spent. And so... The, the follow-on, you know, right. it so, goes to a shareholder, it goes to a scientist, basically. Right, so not every dollar spent on a subscription journal goes to research. Absolutely correct. And then for the purposes, what you're arguing is that, if I understand correctly, is that if you're a nonprofit or a society journal, every additional dollar will go into to, to research. What not the, every, but you know, for most part, yeah. A significant portion. It's not going to a shareholder. And what the OSTP has argued in its paper um, is that they acknowledge that the existence of that externality, what they argue, is that the public dissemination of knowledge creates a yes. flywheel of reinvestment in right. knowledge and innovation that is greater than that extra dollar that, that you would individually reinvest in science. Right. Again, these are de this all goes to my core point, which the, the problem with this is that it's so complicated. It is. You have to have a knowledge of basically three or four different areas of the supply chain of research and then you have to have philosophical leanings one way or the other, which you can err on. And every I field is different, too. It's not appropriate to have this for different fields. Right. And so uh, what I'm saying is it's that complicated. Congress, Congress hasn't had that conversation. That conversation is being had by this community. It, it has been had by the agencies internally, and it's been taking place over many, many years. Because we had the 2013 memo. All these conversations were had. The Trump administration had their own proposal. All these conversations were had. But it has all been had in a fairly non-public way. Um, and the answers aren't readily available. Um, and and there is probably no one answer for everything. The hard, one of the hardest things about when you, when you work, I've worked for 13 years in the United States Senate. I've been through tons of appropriations processes and authorizing processes. I've worked at four uh, agencies in the executive branch of government. You have to make a decision at some point. And it has to be a decision that reflects 
you know, your administration's values and how you want to execute those in the public interest. And for the greater good. And I think that, I think that the OSCP, and, I, and I'm biased, but I think the Biden administration has cl clearly stated what it believes. Now, it may be wrong, right? And I think that in the... We're moving in the right direction, but these are fine. Right, but that's the conversation that we need to have. Mm -hmm. and, we, and I think we're having it, and we will continue to have it, and we'll be increasingly robust. The question does become, well, if you are wrong, how do you turn back the clock at some point? You know, once something is done, it's kind of done. I was just wondering and hoping if this particular element is part of the conversation. There's nothing wrong with making a profit and all that, but um, sometimes when we talk about prices, there may be some level of pricing that it can be addressed through this kind of mission-to-mission -mission approach. That's maybe not just a question. I mean, I think as you see researchers dedicate some percentage of their grant funding to publication, you'll see it at different levels. Yeah. There will be a communal conversation about what level is appropriate. Keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are at time, but before we wrap up, does anyone else have any other questions or any other statements they'd like to make? Well, then with that, I would like to thank Daniel and Michelle and Torsten for your guidance and insights today. Thank you very much. Thank you.